Okay, awesome. All right, all yours. All right, good evening, everyone. Hope everyone had a wonderful spring break. Um, I'd like to call to order the April 12th meeting of the New Canaan Board of Education. Uh, first tonight, we need to approve the minutes from the March 15th and the April 1st meeting. First, March 15th, motion. Sherry, second. Deanna, all in favor? Okay, any abstentions? Looks like everybody was, I think everybody was there, yeah. Um, April 1st, motion to approve. Jen, second. Carl, all in favor? Abstentions, Sherry? Thank you. Uh, next is to review and, our approve, uh, and approve our agenda for this evening. Can I have a motion? Sherry, second. Deanna, all in favor? Okay, thank you. Uh, comments from the public. To ensure the public's right to be heard, the board has set aside time during the meeting for public comments. Two minutes will be allotted to each speaker and a maximum of 15 minutes to each subject. If there's anyone wishing to address the board, please uh, use the raise hand feature and Dr. Lutze will invite you in. Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll move on to reports and recognition section of our meeting. Uh, we have three reports this evening. Uh, we're gonna switch the order around slightly. We'll begin with the COVID update with uh, Dr. Lutze and Mr. Egan in the cabinet, followed by the social studies curriculum update, and then finally the budget update. So Dr. Lessie, I'll turn it over to you for our COVID update. Great, <clears throat> excuse me. And I just promoted uh, Principal Egan to join us as a panelist. Hello, Bill. So I'm going to uh, give a, an overview on a district level. It gives Bill a moment to pull up some slides if he wants to do that. You can share from your computer, Bill, if you'd like to. Um, Briefly, and of course, well, not yet. <laughs> All right, um, that. So just briefly at a, on a district level, um, as you know, we're back in today. I hope everyone had a wonderful spring break. We, uh, we are asking everyone to continue to follow the travel guidance as we've communicated it uh, for the last, you know, since November, really, which was if folks have traveled out of state for more than 24 hours that they test prior to returning into class. Um, our attendance today for our faculty was good across the board. We had um, you know, one, two, four, so staff members out at each of the buildings. So, so far so good, a good return for us uh, and, and back in. We moved, kept moving forward with our vaccinations of staff, those who have signed up to get them on um, April 1st. We had the second round for the first group, which was about 350 people or so. Uh, on April 8th, we had another 300 or so. And then we have another one this week that'll finish off for our school system uh, and folks that are there for the most part. The, um, we're doing those second shots on Fridays because you know, we are hearing some reports that folks feel under the weather, um, my report included. So the, we're also planning for uh, a potential clinic for our students in the upcoming weeks where 16, 17, 18, they can receive the Pfizer shot, as you know. And our health clinic, our health de uh, department went forward early and ordered one of the refrigerators that they can use to store the Pfizer. You know, it has to be stored at a very cold temperature. So because we have those and because Jen and her department are running so well, the state has been working with her and, and delivering Pfizer uh, doses to her. And they come in a tray of a little over a thousand um, doses per tray. So in one day, we may be able to take care of any student who, who wants to go forward and get that shot. Now, of course, it would take uh, parents' permission as well. It, right now, it's only available to students age 16, 17, 18. You know, it's 16 and up for the Pfizer. But we're optimistic in the upcoming weeks, we'll be able to get that together for any of our students who want it. Uh, and of course, it's a two shot sequence with a Pfizer three weeks in between. And it's the, after the second week after the second shot that you're considered fully vaccinated. But a, a real advantage of being fully vaccinated for our students is that once you are, if you are deemed to be a close contact with a known positive case, you no longer have to quarantine. So it provides enough protection where the DPH and the CDC are comfortable saying that uh, 
you know, you, you're okay to continue on. So make a big difference for our kids. Um, because we are, we are seeing quarantines now and a slight uptick in cases for us locally. Uh, as of today, we have eight cases across the K-12 schools with uh, 38 quarantines. Um, the, as spring sports have resumed, we've, we've seen an uptick in our need to quarantine students, uh, in part because of the, again, the rules in the DPH where, so there's a positive case. I need all the players need to quarantine and they do need to quarantine from uh, sports for 14 days. It's 10 days from school and then they can return, but they are off the field or off the court for 14 full days uh, because the, the um, there's still a possibility that they could be positive and could get sick all the way up to day 14. And we've had that happen with a couple of our kids where they were close contacts and they were quarantined. It was on day 12, 13, or 14 that they actually began to exhibit symptoms. So the DPH is worried both about that happening and if we bring teams back and then that happens with one other player, then the whole team has to go out again for a period of time. And they're also worried about the health and safety for the individuals. The reason we can do 10 days to come back to school is because it's deemed an essential function. And we, while they're in school, they're following mitigation strategies, wearing their masks and being safe. So it's a, uh, it's much less risk. There's always a little bit of risk, of course, but it's uh, a more sort of manageable and acceptable risk to allow them to come back into school. There is an expectation though, that they're only going to school. They're not going out with friends. They're not going out to restaurants. They're not going to other events and they're coming to school because they're wearing the masks and being safe and that because it's an essential function. So um, that's something we try to keep, you know, we keep trying to be clear about with our, with our families. Um, guidance came out just in the last couple of days about end of the year activities and school events. I shared it with our PTC PFA presidents this morning. So they, they're now taking this um, guidance, going to be working with their principals and their teams at the schools to put those end of the year events together. And no surprises uh, in these guidance, in the guidance, but it's good to have it spelled out and written down for us. Things like no matter what you're doing, wearing masks, maintaining social distancing, limiting the number of people, keeping track of who's there to cohort them. Um, of course, anyone with symptoms or test positive can't be there. Providing hand sanitizer. So, you know, encouraging those same mitigation strategies we've been using and also talking about um, the difference between inside and outside you know, really trying to have as many events outdoors as possible about um, really trying to eliminate those sort of non-essential things. So it's sort of identifying what are the most important opportunities for kids? What are those sort of milestones that you really want them to experience? Uh, but maybe letting go some of the other things, because what can happen if you don't, we could have a student who goes to maybe it's an NHS induction one night and a world language induction the next night. And then they go to a sports banquet the third night. And then that next morning they, they feel sick and test positive. Everyone that attended all of those events is going to have to quarantine, you know, so instead, so our kids are usually doing lots and lots of things like that. So kind of picking your spot and trying to really identify and focus on making great those things that are most meaningful for kids. Good news is the, the graduation guidance uh, for if graduation is outdoors, your limitation is the, the uh, venue that you're using and your setup there. So today, uh, Bill, Jay, and I had a conversation. I know Bill's continuing to work on it as well um, about how can we safely sort of try to uh, hold a graduation ceremony for our families that at least gets the students and their parents in and maybe does a little bit more. Um, it's, you know, we've got to work within the uh, limitations of the facility, but we do have the, the great fortune of having, you know, Dunning to use for graduation. So it may look a little different, but we're optimistic we'll be able to, uh, to get the parents in there and to make it a great event for everybody. Um, last thing, as you know, I have my DPH calls prior to our, our meetings on Mondays. And so, um, let you know that they are continuing with the, you know, close the definition of close contact being within six feet for 15 minutes or more. It's the same definition we've been using from the beginning. You know, there's been some conversation in some, some quarters about changing that. Uh, really that stemmed from when the CDC made their change about three feet being the minimum instead of six feet for students in schools. But the close contact definition hasn't changed and they're going to stick with that uh, definition. The um, 
we you know, we hear talk about variants. Uh, we have all of the variants of concern in Connecticut. Um, the one, you know, UK, New York, others, they're all, they've all been found here. Um, and we are still seeing high rates of community transmission. So, um, you know, this, these steps that we're taking are keeping us safe in schools, but now's not the time to let up. So we're going to continue with the mitigation strategies as we've had them. Um, they are what's helping keep our schools open and, and keeping our, our kids and our teachers and everybody safe. So we continue forward with that. And, Bill, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you for a quick uh, look at what's going on at the high school. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you for having me here tonight. Uh, it's always, uh, I always love coming before the Board of Ed. But I'll try not to be too repetitive of the other principals who outlined many of the mitigation strategies that we've been using here to make New Canaan successful during the pandemic. But I do want to say a special thank you to the entire community. You know, truly, I think we have the most supportive parents and the absolute best students in the state. They are so kind and so talented. This year, they showed a renewed sense of love for school. that was really heartwarming to see. You know, our teachers were, were very resilient and deserve so much praise. They demonstrated tremendous flexibility, whether it be the schedule changes, teaching kids in person and at home. You know, and with, through all of it, they made students feel loved and cared for while creating excellent learning environments. Our nurses, custodians, food service staff, and all support staff deserve so much praise because truly without all of them, we wouldn't have been able to pull off what we did this year. You know, truly school is the heartbeat of the community. And, you know, on this page, you see many of our VPA uh, pieces. We have our, our band outside by the flagpole. You know, they really had to recreate what they did. You know, our visual performing arts were really kind of hit hard in, in many of the uh, strategies that they had to uh, and use this year. And ultimately, you see some of them here, uh, whether it be they created a virtual concerts, uh, whether it be, uh, you know, a uh, putting together an, like an album, whether it be outside classes. Um, and truly, creativity and learning shined throughout everything we did. You know, you see in here our use of tents that we had this year. You know, teachers got together and, and had their PLCs outside. Woodworking still happened, you know, everything beyond, behind plexiglass. Our science labs still happened, but they were in, done individually. Um, and things like foods, we're able to do labs, whether we were home or in school. Our art classes, sorry, I'm minimizing myself here. Our art classes were able to be, be uh, able to go on, whether it be virtually or in class. You know, truly, uh, teachers were creative throughout the pandemic. Additionally, we have so many traditions that we, we uh, use every year at New Canaan High School. And this year they had to be done differently. But some of that will be really uh, helpful as we move forward to the future, whether it be a welcome backs that we did or eighth grade orientation, we had to really kind of revisit and redo it. Uh, you know, our, our traditions like cocoa and cane still happen, but it was done differently. And obviously our parent workshops were done um, virtually and in different ways throughout the year. But truly, in some ways, they were more uh, well attended than they have been in the past because it gave parents flexibility to be able to come at different times. And that was something uh, pretty amazing. I also want to thank each and every one of you uh, for all your support this year. and. I also want to thank Brian and the entire cabinet for everything they did because truly uh, teamwork was on display throughout the year and without all of their support for us at the high school and really all the schools, nothing would have been possible. So, but thank you and I'd be willing to take any questions. Pull back thank you all for that. Um, okay, I see a couple hands. Uh, Jen? Can you hear me? I can. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, Bill, you have just done such a tremendous job. Um, we are, are so lucky to have you um, in this role. And, I mean, just from the Santa Claus outfit to the cookies, and, I mean, the, you've just made the kids feel so special and just given them a little bit of normalcy during this crazy time. And I know that you and everyone, the teachers and staff and all the principals, you guys have just done such a great job, and we are just we thank you so much for everything. Well, well, thank you. I feel fortunate to be a small part of the community. 
Brendan. Thanks, Bill. I echo uh, what Jen said. You're doing a, an outstanding job, so I appreciate it. Um, just a quick question on how things have been going since uh, since you've had the whole school back, um, you know, in school. Um, you know, how have things how have things gone, and are you seeing any sort of you know challenges associated with that? Um, and then, sort of, a second question is uh, just from a sports perspective, um, how are we managing things there? Uh, first, first of all, I, I think I could be more fortunate to have Jay as our athletic director. I'll start with the second part first. Um, you know, uh, he's a great uh, person to have as uh, a colleague to work with, and, and he's creative and thoughtful and is always trying to make sure that our athletics program uh, is supportive and our kids and families really are participants. You know, he's truly a leader in trying to um, – I don't know, make our families be as present as possible in such a challenging time. So, uh, you know, tremendous kudos goes, goes out to him. You know, honestly, we wanted all year to have our, our, our kids at full capacity. And, you know, we uh, were trying to be creative throughout the time of going to our hybrid plus model and then now full time. Uh, you know, some, some, it, it's been awesome having all the kids back in the building. Um, you know, there's some space challenges in the cafeteria, but we've had so much outside seating that kids really enjoy going outside. Um, and that's been good. Uh, you know, I would say one thing, you know, we had a couple of discipline issues that we do, we, uh, or normal school uh, type of issues that we deal with with kids. And I think in, in many respects, that was a good thing, trying to have kids uh, back together and, and uh, have some, some normal normalcy to having adolescents back in the building. Thanks, Bill. Julie. So I want to add my thanks to um, you, Bill, and to your whole staff and teachers. Um, you know, as Jen and Brennan said, I just think that the efforts that you put in to make this year feel as normal as it could be, despite all the, you know, difficulties, it, you know, it's it's been uh, having a senior and knowing all those sort of milestones that seniors look forward to even when they didn't happen or happen differently. I think you guys have still um, managed to make it uh, seem pretty special. So thank you so much. Um, along the, the milestone route, I just wondered, uh, do, you, do you guys, and I appreciate that things are still in flux and we don't know everything about graduation, but do we have a, a date you know, is that has that date been finalized or is that something that is still to be determined? Well, Brian and you guys actually will finalize that, that date. Um, OK, we did. We so we started discussing uh, some things today and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn to say that, Brian, but we're working through that still. OK. All right. That's great. That's right. Um, yeah, thank you. And thanks to the, you know, the PFA that works in conjunction with you. I know they um, put in hours trying to figure out things and especially the end of the year stuff. So thank you. They're truly tremendous partners because uh, honestly, they they are always trying to do what's best for kids and enhance our culture. So, thanks. Yeah, I just you know, I, everyone said it so well. But thanks for all you're doing, and I, I want to give a shout out to the the TV broadcasting team because I feel like in a year where we don't have access to all of these events, they've done a phenomenal job bringing the events to us and giving us access and just the photography and the newsletters. I just, you, you know, as parents, we still feel really connected and I know the kids do too. So um, thank you for everything you're doing and, and the entire team there at the high school. Well, thanks. I said that to Roman the other day, um, you know, we had the uh, color drop and, and uh, we were just talking. I said, you know, it's become normal now for our TV crew to be like celebrities in the community, you know, the, the people really love them and they do such an amazing job. So I mean, kudos to him and his program. Great, thank you. Okay, so next is our social studies curriculum update, unless there's anything else to add on the COVID front. Nope. Uh there's always enough to add to fill hours, but I think you've got the highlights. And so what I'll do is invite Bob and Mary to join us here and uh, ask Dr. Carenti if she'd like to give an intro. I would love to. 
And also, Brian, can you give uh, Mary privileges to share? You're all set. Excellent. Should be all set. Uh, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce Mary Hanna, who is our K through eight social studies coordinator, and Bob Stevenson, who is our social studies department chair at the high school. So Bob and Mary were in front of the board back in 2015 when the social studies standards were finally approved by the state of Connecticut. So it is long overdue that they come back and give you a presentation on where we are with our social studies curriculum and update you. And they're going to try to take you through at least one standard that will show like a K-12 perspective. Um, and they made that decision to try to just give you what it would look like if you were to see it in the kindergarten versus a fifth grade versus in high school. Um, but um, I'm going to turn it over to them and then we'll open it up for questions. Great. Thank you so much. I am going to just see if I can share this with you. And uh, while Mary's sharing it, I'd like to... Ahead. I would echo uh, Principal Egan. Uh, it's been really great having kids back in the building. I've had a bunch of classes with full attendance. Teachers really appreciate all the efforts of the, the staff, students, administration, and families. So thank you. Uh, sorry to preempt the, this. I think it's all tied together, right? Everything's all tied together this year. Right. right. Absolutely. Well, we are thrilled to be here uh, with you all. And I know that both Bob and I could speak for hours and hours because we are so excited about everything that's happening K-12, but we have tried to limit this a little bit tonight so that we can all uh, rest after the end of the meeting. I think, Bob, you're going to kick it off? Sure. So uh, first of all, thanks, Mary, for all your work with me, and thank you to Jill for your guidance throughout this. Uh, we, we've kept the agenda pretty simple, and uh, the slide number's down. Uh, we've got just four things to work through, the first being uh, just to look at the frameworks and, and guidance that underlies our work. Um, we'll look at that very briefly. Then we're going to dive right into the inquiry arc as our um, as our lens to look at, at, at our work with students K through 12. I think it's something going on in almost every class, almost every day. So it, it makes sense as a, a key component of our work with students throughout all 13 years with them. And then we'll talk about uh, some professional learning that we're done to keep current and, and keep improving. And then uh, finally, we'll look at uh, next steps, K through eight and, and nine through 12. Terrific. So step one is our guiding frameworks. And as I'm looking around at FACES, and I think that many of you were not here when we had a chance to share this with you in 2015, uh, we won't go through it in depth, um, but lead it, you know, just have it su suffice that um, this is sort of our guiding um, work that helps us to uh, create units that meet the needs of the students in New Canaan. Um, and some of you remember that about concurrently, we were also updating our K-4 elementary sequence about the same time um, as Dr. Carenti mentioned, the standards were passed by the State Board of Education in 2015, but they were in works several years before. Um, I was fortunate to be on the elementary team and be a reader for the middle school team. So that allowed us to do some work in our district too, to align with standards sort of before it was um, actually in print. So um, we began that work and I think our current year, our current eighth graders are probably the first ones that have gone through the whole elementary sequence um, as written. Um, we continually revise um, and tweak things as needed to be responsive to the world around us and to our students. Um, about 2015, we still had some old 20, 2009 units in grade five through eight, so started re-envisioning re those as well and bringing that all up. The, on the high school front, the sequence hasn't uh, adjusted significantly, um, but we, we as a, as a subsetting here, I wanted to mention that um, really the College Board historical thinking skills that we're working with all kids toward, they fit nicely within the Connecticut Social Studies framework and are a nice extension of that. And, and I think nicely aligned with our, our board goal to, to work with all students toward college readiness um, in high school and beyond. So this is the inquiry arc. Um, it sort of 
forms four different dimensions, which allow us uh, four different sets of skills. So dimension one is developing questions and planning inquiries. Two is applying disciplinary tools and concepts. Three, as you can read, is evaluating sources using evidence. And four is allowing students that opportunity to communicate those conclusions that they've reached after the inquiry or to take informed action. And we're going to just go through a snippet of different grade bands showing you what that inquiry arc looks like um, over time. And, and I, I think, I hope what you'll see is uh, a few trends throughout these four dimensions over the course of the K-12 curriculum, where we, you know, we have maybe a little more teacher selected sources early on and gradually students are doing more and more of the selection themselves and, and the same with questioning and the same with, well, although uh, the, the work we've looked at uh, the, the early on kindergarten, they're asking plenty of great questions uh, to start the arc off. Uh, we, we wanted to give you a, a visual of this previous slide that we just saw. Uh, this is, it's not a perfect explanation of the four uh, pieces, uh, but that, that center circle would be what we're talking about when we talk about inquiry, where students are developing questions, uh, gathering evidence, using their evidence and communicating conclusions. That, but surrounding that is this uh, constant feedback with history, geography, economics, and civics. Great. So you'll see on the on the right hand side of this slide uh, just a picture of a grade one unit, um, our town, and you can see some of the different parts and where the inquiry art comes into play. Um, in 2017, we did some work with the Curriculum Leadership Council to really align our curricular documents. We found that we were all using UBD but they looked different. So a teacher, especially at elementary, where they're teaching five subjects, would have maybe a different one template for social studies and maybe a different one for another subject. So um, we all went through some training, which was UBD 2.0. It added a transfer goal there and allowed us the opportunity to work with the new standards, put them into the units, and really think collaboratively together about what that might look like for our students. Um, so that no matter what the subject area, I could go in to an interior decorating class uh, UBD and understand where all the different facets of um, their curriculum were. So, oh, Mary, I'm, I'm calling a little bit of an audible. Here's here's an example from ninth okay. grade that we looked in at the curriculum console, and you can see the form is exactly the same. Yeah, the, the language is exactly the same, and uh, the approach is exactly the same. K through twelve. Absolutely. You'll see just flanking, you know, there's an overview, the transfer goal, some of the concept lenses we use as sort of the glue um, to connect that content with the skills and understanding. Um, our standards are, are sort of flanked on that left hand side. You can see the dimension and sort of what a standard looks like for a couple of the dimensions. And then this gets sort of actualized down under acquisition, what we want students to know and what we want them to be able to do at the end of the year unit, um, along with those enduring understandings and those powerful essential questions, which we may see, as Bob alluded to, a question in kindergarten then that gets used again over time at different complexity as, as students mature in different ways. So, Bob, you were going to talk about the process, too, on the left, right? Sure. And I kind of I wanted to reassure the board and the public, our correct curriculum isn't it's not something we adopt from somewhere. We're building this ourselves and we, we take pieces from a thousand different sources that make sense for our students. We're, tr we're trying to be responsive, not only to the national, state and local guidance, but uh, to the CLC input that I'll go over in a second and, and uh, the needs of our, our students. So the cycle on the left here uh, emphasizes that it really is this, this cycle of input from a variety of places, but it's really the district leadership that's doing the work to look at the curriculum to uh, lead uh, teachers through the development process. It's very much teachers involved in creating these documents and, and vetting them and thinking about them uh, in, in terms of what we know our students need. So uh, in fact, today we were looking, the reason I had the ninth grade piece here is today we were looking at a unit uh, with the CLC uh, from the, the ninth grade first unit um, as a group. 
Oh, and, and I guess I should mention that. So th this cycle is periodic. We come, we'll come back to this unit after I've made some adjustments and I'll bring it back to CLC. We'll look at it again. Um, and, and I'll bring it back to teachers and we'll get, uh, and constantly go through the cycle of making it a better, better course, better unit, uh, better materials and, and, um, improved alignment with what we know students uh, need to do. All right. So it's a quote from Carter Woodson. If you're not familiar with Carter Woodson, he's known as sort of the father of black history. Um, I think it, at some point in college, it must have been that uh, professor said, well, wait a minute, there's no black history here. And he has pledged his life to really make sure that more voices were included. And our third grade, when we think about creating um citizens um, and helping our kids to engage in citizens have a book um, Carter loves to read which talks about literacy and how just reading is an important skill of being a citizen and being an informed citizen and learning about all of the history so um, thought I'd start off with that quote so k5 social studies sort of the inquiry arc in action here is our k5 unit sequence and i know it's going to seem very topical you won't see all the enduring understandings and all of that that you saw in the unit organizer but it should give you a sampling a little taste from a high level um, about what our units look like um, one thing I, I you probably can see is that right away they're in a chronological order and our first unit at each grade level is really talking about civics and starting with that um, identity of students. Um, and I think that's really important place to start. And uh, we there's been some recent research out, too. I'm not sure if you've read it, but um, in 2020, the Thomas Fordman, Fordman um, Institute released a longitudinal study that echoed the importance of social studies um, in reading acquisition. Um, so what we sort of guessed a long time uh, for a long time is actually had uh, research to back it. Um, so you'll notice the civics. You're also going to notice as, as you go through the years um, that our students are also venturing out beyond just their community. Um, to some other continents. So when we created the elementary sequence, um, it was decided to have sort of a different continent each year. And we've continued with that, although the focus has changed slightly throughout the years. Um, that has allowed our students to really take what they understand about themselves and their communities and really their own identity and learn about groups of people from different times or different places that are not them. How do we learn about the world? What are those questions we should ask? How do we make sure that there's not a single story narrative that's running through? How can we ask and push against some of that? Um, and this fits in with some of our standards that are mapped all the way up through to the AP standards of, of looking at change over time and, and multiple perspectives um, and comparing and contrasting. So even our young students are um, you know, allowed to, to do some of that thinking, which really gets to some of those transfer goals we want as um, citizens. Here's a quote from the frameworks that talks about the um, rigorous high quality social studies instruction or education involves students as active thinkers and agents of their own learning and recognizes the importance of both discipline specific content knowledge, essential literacy, research and communication skills. So, you know, the teacher is not the sage on stage giving all the information. We invite our students into the whole process to um, create questions and co-work with questions to try to find out the answers. So um, dimension one, we can't invite you into our classrooms. Um, so we thought we would do a pictorial view of what our classrooms look like. And I know Principal Egan shared mostly um, COVID related pictures. Um, Mr. Stevenson and I decided we'd broaden it a little bit. So you'll see people that are not masked, but I don't want to alarm you. These pictures are not all from this year. So please don't panic, we're following all guidance that has been given to us and kids are safe. Um, just a few questions you'll see in the middle, uh, two of our student, two groups wrestling with um, some big questions. What makes an American? 
certainly resonates with all of us, even as adults, right? How are conflicts resolved? And they're jotting down their ideas, adding on, questioning each other. On the left, you'll see um, some questions from students. They did a DBQ on Timbuktu and what made it so powerful. They had a set curated set of sources in fourth grade. And these are other questions that the students came up with. So yes, the, the official sort of inquiry unit was done, but students still had questions. So the teacher was trying to catalog these, connect with the library to say that, you know, inquiry never really ends, that questions are a wonderful thing about us, right, as humans, as citizens, that we want to always ask questions and find out how we can find answers to them. And then the anchor chart on the right is just showing how a teacher sort of guided some students through looking at specific um, economic and geographic lenses into some of the questions. And Mary, uh, uh, DBQ, for those who don't know, it's a document-based question. And those ride, we use them straight from kindergarten through 12th grade. Yeah, the beauty of a DBQ is that you've curated a few sources to allow for multiple perspectives and multiple um, opinions, arguments um, can be made with a, a driving question. Um, so just to show you a little bit what this looks like in Dimension 2, um, more of the content part of the inquiry arc. And, you know, I would say that at this level, we're um, really looking at, you know, our charter has been really foundational. You know, we're a nation of charter. We've got the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution. You know, you can go back to the Mayflower Compact. There are charters. We are a country of charters. There were charters, the people, the Native Americans that lived here before us had charters. So we come from a rich tradition of deciding as a group of people how we want to feel, how we want to act, and what that means. So much of our EI work really fits in naturally, especially in the beginning of the unit. Um, when you look at something like the Constitution or the Declaration, and you think about some of the concepts over here on the right is an example of a charter. And we've got words like, you know, safety and inclusion. And those were certainly, even when you think about British colonies, those were words that came to mind when people were creating some of our founding documents. So our students are enmeshed in that, working together to sort of think through what makes a citizen. Um, geography um, is very crucial. Just a few snapshots you'll see on the top pictures of students who are Zooming or Skyping in the past. We used to do some Skyping um, back in 2020. Um, and they are um, matched up with a class somewhere around the country. And they've got to figure out where that mystery classroom is from. Um, I've got a colleague from an undisclosed state and we match them up around the country to make sure that all of our students get a chance to um, meet students from other states. So this has been a wonderful thing that we've done it even in the pandemic, we've been able to do it. Um, the bottom two pictures are some giant maps that we're thrilled to have that allow a more kinesthetic approach for our youngsters. These are not pictures from this year. Um, we're just still wrapping our head around what safety protocols might look like for giant maps and a whole group of kids being on them this year. But um, we hope to be back, but it's a great way to learn geography and wrestle with some questions about proximity and location. And, you know, you live at this part of the river and I live at this part of the river. Well, what does that mean um, to living in the same area? And then we see some things on the other, on the right-hand side, um, just some other pictures of things that are, are going on um, with computers. So history, history is rich on the top left. We see a museum at a kindergarten level with some artifacts that have been collected and some pictures. As students look at change over time, we do wash. The past they did wash, we do wash today. What does that look like? How is it the same and how is it different? What are some tools students will go home and go on a scavenger hunt? What are some pictures that show my family in the past? What are some objects that maybe were used in the past that we're still using now? How are traditions maybe passed down and same or different? So even our early students are taking on that lens of historian. 
On the right is um, a, a simulated archaeological dig that we sometimes do in grade two um, as we learn about how we learn about history. And at the bottom, you see two um, gentlemen engaged looking at a document um, from the Roanoke, the lost colony of Roanoke, trying to figure out what exactly happened. Um, we got very passionate fifth graders that think they've figured it out, even when um, I think evidence points that we still have uh, a ways to go. So they're working on DBQ. And I'm um, just moving over to even economics. Even at a young age, at the upper right, the uh, students are looking at a model of a cotton gin. Um, student, on the left-hand side is a performance task we have in grade three where they create an exposition. This is from 2014. It really um, connects geography and economics. Here they've decided as, Was as a class that Washington, D.C. is a location for the expo, which took some geographic and economic thinking because they wanted a place that was going to make an expo viable. Um, and they decided that a big metropolitan area would be the most advantageous. We've got other classes that decide there was a great airport near some place in more of a desert area and that they needed to bring revenue to this area and that that would be the place that they should do it. So it weaves in some of that thinking. Um, and our, our students at the bottom are role playing uh, being farmers somewhere on the timeline of the Connecticut River, and they're trying to figure out who they should trade with um, that might be there on the river. And I, we're gonna talk more about sources and evidence as we go up in time, but um, our students are using everything from maps that they bring in from home to artifact boxes that we get from Boston University that are filled with artifacts from a school in Kenya. And we imagine what we would put in and what story they tell, what story they don't tell. And then we've got the traditional, you know, sets of books and, and Internet and, and all of those, you know, many, many different kinds of resources, along with the primary sources that you saw before. And dimension four for elementary school, communicating inclusions and informed action. On the left, you might recognize Tucker Murphy, who then of the uh, Chamber of Commerce. And these young first graders are sharing their ideas for pop-up parks that they think that she should uh, pursue. This was a few years ago and she actually brought the ideas back to the board. Um, I'm not sure that we do any pop-up parks right now, but Maybe some of these ideas are hopefully are floating around for some future pop-up parks. Um, in the middle, we see um, so two students looking at some work by some fourth graders about family history. Our fourth graders are encouraged to ask their family if they know about their immigration history or a, a tradition and they come in and share. And I will say that this little inquiry along with the oral histories that they create, um, could be in fact the whole unit because we learn more and see more primary sources than we ever, we could just going to the Smithsonian or some other place that has them. It's just rich what is in our family and our community already. Um, and then on the right is sort of an exciting thing. Our fifth graders got an opportunity to run for kid governor. Yes, it is an office and it is an office that does things. They have platforms and they put the platform into action. Um, each year, I think this is about the third or fourth year that Connecticut has joined. We um, started a bit late this year, but we had 13, um, all students create a platform that they would, if they were to run, what would that platform be in Connecticut governor? And we had 13 students that decided to run for governor. Um, they did not make it to the governor, but um, we were immensely proud of each and every one of them. And, you know, COVID, you know, didn't get in the way at all. We had little 30 minute promo videos that we all watched in the fifth grade and all the fifth grades voted. Um, and Jake was our uh, sax representative. So very proud of that. Um, work. And now we're going to go to six through eight. And again, this is another quote about inquiry. And I, I think that when I take, you know, one thing away is when we're educating 
the next generation of citizens, how important that, you know, problem solving and, and reasoning and this whole inquiry is, that it's not just consuming the information, but we're also being able to be agents uh, and show agency throughout. So here is our sequence in middle school. You'll notice that grade six and seven sort of form one year according to our, our standards group. It's world region study year one, world region study year two. Um, we do start with a bit of ancient um, civilization studies in sixth grade. Um, but we've shifted the lens a little bit from just going through sort of the litany of every single civilization. We've really grouped them um, via concept lenses. And so our first units, Discovering Cultural Landscapes, we use Egypt as ancient Egypt as a case study. It's less about finding out about Egypt and more about helping our students develop those questions and that lens of how do I find out more about Egypt? Um, you can see sort of as we go through, we talk about cultural hearths, which you might know as sort of cradles of civilization. But uh, um, when we broaden it to cultural hearths, we can even think that New York was a cultural hearth of certain kinds of culture um, and that there are modern cultural hearths as well. So there's some nice transference there. Um, you'll see in grade seven, we're dealing a lot with natural resources and the opportunities and challenges those provide countries. Um, and we use, again, a case study um, approach. And in U.S. history, we sort of are thermat chronothematic, I guess you would say. We do go through history, set them up with um, the foundation. We look at unit one, meeting the needs of the people. How did the government do it? Who were the people? What were their needs? Whose needs got met? Whose needs may not have gotten met at that time? So, we analyze that and then run that through different eras so that we're continuing to look at that as America takes more and more of a, a role on the world stage. So I'm going to go quickly through these so that we won't be here all night. Um, but I want to show you a little bit about what it looks like to develop questions and plan inquiry in the middle school level. You'll see on the right um, something called the QFT, which is a question formulation technique. It's a tool that we use to generate questions with a prompt. Um, we can often use an enduring understanding and students will create questions off of this. And then they'll sort them, which are closed questions that are gonna give me factual answers that are needed, but they support some of the bigger questions. What are those bigger questions that we can really wrestle with that we might have opposing opinions or multiple perspectives about? And you'll see on the left, a group of students using Bloom's taxonomy to sort of figure out what level their questions are and to work with some of this. In the middle is a finished project, but I wanted to sort of share, I think it, it was a good illustration of how this really um, comes to pass. In one of our units in grade eight, we do talk about Japanese internment and the Smithsonian Institute has a great set of posters that they use to um, engage in a museum-like way, um, engage audiences. And so we decided to create an inquiry where students would also create their own posters that could be used to, in a museum-like setting to sort of educate and, when I say provoke, but uh, allow people in to the question, to think about what that meant then in that period, what these questions mean today. And you can see that students have come up with a question, what can we do to make America fair? So although all the primary sources that the students have found and have, um, they've put some captions in, they found some quotes, those all have to do with Japanese internment. You can see how their questions go far beyond that. You know, in what way can we establish justice while providing security to all Americans? I mean, it resonates today and it resonated then. So those concepts of safety, fear, power, um, rights as America throughout history gets has a broader reach. What does that mean on the home front as well as just on the world stage? So we have the same four core disciplines. Um, 
throughout, but it gets a little messier when we get to middle school. It gets a little bit more interact, you know, interconnected. Um, just a few snapshots. I'm not going to go through all of them, but um, I think you probably remember I've been here more recently talking about digital citizenship and our, our social studies teachers do work with digital citizenship, um, which is an idea, which is, you know, another subject, but a way to um, tie together civics. Um, and let's see, I'm going to share with you. I can't quite see that. Let me see if I move that over. You'll see the gentleman in the middle, thanks to our PTC at uh, SACS, a little shout out to them. Uh, Mr. McCormick purchased uh, four VR headsets. We felt very, social studies doesn't get the gadgets, really. Middle school, we just don't get all the gadgets that science does. So we were thrilled to find with some research that, um, our students had talked about Brazil and resources and multiple perspectives from the indigenous to the business owner, to the farmer, to what all that meant, that we couldn't find a Brazil rainforest appropriate field trip to go on. But through VR, we were able to go to Borneo. So the students had to go one at a time, but you actually meet a holographic person, I'm probably explaining this incorrectly, um, who talks about all the multiple perspectives in land use in the rainforest in Borneo. So we're thrilled um, when we looked at VR probably six or seven years ago, we didn't see the level that we really wanted to see in social studies. It wasn't worth the investment, but um, these VR headsets really are a game changer. Um, our eighth grade teachers are thrilled that you could actually go to Anne Frank's house and you can tour around. Um, so lots of great um, opportunities there. Just a few other things you can see students working on, you know, maps. We do a lot with GIS and pinning through Google Maps. Um, you know, sources, and you can see someone who's shown their supply and demand and even the game of Catan, which we will bring in sometimes in grade seven at several different times to have kids collaborate and, and transfer some of their skills. So multitude of sources, it gets a little harder to see once kids are on the computer, um, but our students are working with a variety of primary sources and learning how to um, not only find them, but to read them. Um, Reading skills are still important up in middle school, um, and we still teach into those sources and how to evaluate what sources are appropriate, which are not for my question. How do I do that? And it's ever changing. It used to be that we would say, oh, stay away from anything that is a dot com, and that's no longer true. Now we've got to sort of go into the weeds a little bit more and help our students be more discerning about the sources that they use. And at the end, communicating conclusions and informed action is always an exciting time, whether it's up on the right hand side where they've chosen a an audience and purpose to share their research on a cultural hearth, um, or they're in the middle there with an eighth grade doing a academic discussion, sort of a modified Socratic seminar where you've got an inner circle um, who's created questions and are self generating the whole conversation. Our outer circle sometimes is taking notes and sometimes they're coaching actually. We will sometimes do um, a fishbowl kind of thing where they will stop in the middle after about 15 minute discussion and the person behind them will give them sort of director's notes about, oh, you know, this is a good question or, you know, we haven't brought up this source yet. Maybe you could lead with this. And so we help, um, train them as, as peers to have even more complex discussions. And that was 6-8 social studies. So I'm going to turn it over to Bob and tell you how they do in 9 through 12. Thanks. Thanks, Mary. That was great. Uh, I, I love, I think I might have seen one of my kids in a picture there. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, gr great stuff. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about the 912 uh, curriculum, which in in many ways it'll feel redundant because it is this cycle of inquiry that we're doing every single year uh, with kids that gets uh, there's more independence and uh, I think from kids in their approach and in their organization and their work with it. Uh, the place to start is our, our 912 uh, 9 through 12 course selection. I have this in two charts because 
we really have two things students do in, in the social studies department at the high school. In nine through 12, they have some required courses. So all students take a world history one course. Uh, and I've listed the units there just to emphasize that our structure in the history courses is mostly, it's a periodization, and Mary mentioned this, a combination of chronology where chronology meets theme. So we stretch out the, the borders of the old chronological units um, so that we capture American, early American civilizations with uh, East Asian and uh, Europe, Euro, Afro-Eurasian, uh, early Afro-Eurasian civilizations. So uh, we don't have a, a Greece, a Rome unit anymore. There are these these uh, cross-cultural uh, examinations of the world. So in ninth grade, we look at people before history. Uh, there is a, a, a rise and fall of ancient civilizations followed by a rise and fall of classical civilizations. But again, the chronology there is stretched beyond the, uh, the European definition of, of that that was in control for many years of uh, high school history courses. Um, in unit four, we look at a Middle Ages, but it's a Middle Ages, not European. It's not just Europe versus Japan anymore as it was 25 years ago. Now it's really a, a cross-cultural look at Africa, uh, the Middle East, Central Asia, the Europe uh, as uh, uh, Europe and, and the Americas. And then in fifth unit on the Renaissance Reformation and globalization, uh, no longer a Eurocentric kind of course. It's, it's, a, it's about the whole world. Um, in 10th grade, students take, they have, they start to have some choice, uh, between a world history two course. That's a really a modern world history course that picks up and reviews a little bit of the unit five from world his, world one. Uh, and there's also an AP world history modern course. This is the second or third. I think this is the third year they've offered the modern course. Um, and, uh, it, it, it mirrors the curriculum in world history too, and it's open to students by recommendation and uh, through appeal. Um, and, and we we have it's well subscribed this year, and uh, just got the the appeals and numbers for next year uh, preliminary ones. So that's exciting to work with. In eleventh grade, students get three different options: a U.S. history course. Uh, they can appeal or be recommended for AP U.S. history. And then there's a third interesting offering where we have an American studies course where students in the same room can take an honors uh, or regular section. And it's a, a an L.A. teacher, a language arts teacher and a social studies teacher in the same room with 50 students. Um, and it's the large instructional room at the, the high school. Senior year students have uh, three options. Some take this. 11th grade, but many uh, senior year, they can take either civics, AP comparative government, or AP US uh, United States government. All of those count toward the state's civics requirement and our graduation requirement in civics. On the right-hand side, we see uh, a suite of electives that we offer. Those have only changed slightly, very slightly in the last six years since we were here last. We've added cultural anthropology. It fills a nice hole between anthropology and sociology that we don't offer separately. Um, and, and it's well subscribed and students are enjoying it. And we've added, I think we've added since the last time to the AP macro and micro economics courses, we now offer an ECE UConn extended extension credit. So they can actually get college credits. As you may or may not know, some of the AP courses are no longer granting, the colleges aren't granting as many credits. These are credits that, that would transfer to a vast majority of, of colleges. So where it makes sense, we're trying to plug in the, the pieces that uh, our students uh, would benefit from. Maybe moving on to the next. So I, I too will walk through the four dimensions here and I, I don't have the, the content specific pieces where um, everybody's working on the exact same thing. We have in many cases, 15, 16 sections of these courses on, on the freshman course we have uh, 10 different teachers on that, that freshman world history course um, this year. But these are some of the kinds of things you'll see students doing around the building. And again, a lot of this is pre-COVID just because the pictures are, are more exciting than students distanced with masks in rows. Uh, I, man, we've, we figured out great ways uh, to get students working in breakout rooms and, and other tools and in hallways spread out, but uh, they don't make for as good a picture as kids gathered around a piece of paper uh, working uh, together, uh, brainstorming. So this is uh, some, some instances of students generating their own questions. You've got in the middle uh, the, the whiteboard that was in the 
library's um, flexible space where the whole room is surrounded with whiteboards. So we have different groups of students working on uh, different subjects. You've got a uh, brainstorming on internet regulation. That was a senior, junior civics class. We have some students uh, grappling with different diets around the world on the left uh, and again out in the hallways um, doing some organization of uh, kinds of grains that are grown in different parts of the world and kinds of um, diets we see. Um, in the lower left hand corner, I, I did want to emphasize we have a great partnership with the library and, and ICT uh, folks, the tech folks, and, and this is kind of a a library specific inquiry cycle that you see there. It's got fancy graphics, but underlying it is the same cycle of students generating questions, planning, gathering evidence, and then presenting their findings. Um, and on the lower right, that's some organization of civilizations through the old Persia GT model and playing around with where where elements are, are influencing each other, or say where economics are influencing the politics or the um, the, the social structure of a society. Okay, on uh, so for applying disciplinary tools again, like in middle school, we didn't, I didn't include separate slides for each one because they're so intertwined the work students are doing, um, and, and we offer so many different courses. So uh, you're seeing in the upper left hand corner here are some students uh, teaching each other um, economics principles. The they make tapes of them and uh, and are teaching uh, other members of the class and even we'll see other classes uh, economic principles. We've got a, a photo of students working out in one of the tents uh, doing uh, some some research and research isn't exciting to see uh, maybe uh, when it's on a computer but uh, it's it's a, a, necess a necessity right now and it's one uh, we're really proud of the range of databases that the library has been able to help us offer to students. On the upper right, you see students grappling. Again, Mary mentioned the GIS work they're doing with layers of data in, in the middle school. We're doing it in the high school, too. So here they're grappling with different layers of data uh, related to African um, uh, geography and, and, and culture. In the lower left, you see students uh, negotiating, in this case, um, from the point of view of different uh, national representatives of world in World War One, they're trying to stop the war from happening, and they're negotiating uh, uh, press releases. Uh, we do lots of simulation in the department to uh, work on collaboration, um, diplomacy, debate. Uh, in the bottom middle, that's a, a sad picture because we don't have the maker space this year. It's not safe for students to be in there working close to one another, but it'll be back and it's a great way for students to put uh, civic, geographic, historical and economic principles into visual um, uh, thinking. And, and, and it's great to see they, they dive into that uh, space and, and really make the most of it. Um, and, and until this year, our classes were decorated with the products of that, but uh, we want to make sure we keep Connors clear this year. So that's uh, changed a little bit. In the lower right, just some students illustrating. This was illustrating principles using the snow on a snow day, uh, I think. So we're, we're trying to be really creative with how we ask students to um, grapple with the, the different tools uh, of social studies. Uh, this slide, I, I went less emphasis on the pictures because I think it's important to understand what students are doing with evidence. Um, the top left and middle uh, are our assessment pieces where students are looking at either uh, on the top left, I guess we start with that. Uh, we're looking at uh, criticisms of the Articles of Confederation and students grappling again in a DBQ format where they look at three letters or excerpts or they're all letters and uh, deciding what it is, instead of reading in a textbook what the problems with the Articles of Confederation are, they may have already previewed that, but now they're actually going to the source of uh, the arguments. And in the top middle, these stimulus-based questions really started at the AP level and have trickled down uh, to all our students in all our classes, where students are not just asked to memorize aspects of civilization, but they're grappling with applying what they know about civilizations to photographic evidence. Um, in this case, Features of Civilizations, I, I think that's Teno Katitlan. And the upper right, this is, uh, we're doing more and more digital organization of evidence with students, but we don't, we haven't abandoned the paper uh, version. Again, this is a previous year, but you see students grappling with lots of quotes. Those were religious quotes from Buddhism and Hinduism uh, they were grappling with. 
And in the middle, we see a couple of different versions of student evalu students evaluating sources. Um, one, the one on the right is through the library and, and they're sort of testing sources to see which ones are valid uh, for, for using for different purposes and, and what is the bias in the source and uh, how do we make sure we, we, we trust it and can use it and uh, appropriately in our writing. Um, and then in the lower left, uh, students are out around the building looking at uh, World War One propaganda posters. There are a bunch of them hanging in the building, and we actually use them as evidence uh, in, in the World History two courses. So I think that it gives you sort of an idea that there's a lot of, you know, although we're showing you pictures of, of people, you know, in groups writing on paper, there's a lot going on where students are reading high level documents uh, and, and being given lots of tools to work with those uh, documents, both independently and as you see in some of these pictures together. Thanks. Uh, so for this, this final piece, the, the fourth dimension communicating conclusions and, informed action. Uh, I'm really proud at New Canaan of, of this piece that so many of so much of this well, it wasn't here 15 years ago when I, when I came to the district and I'm not saying I brought it it's happened in education and we've we've uh, it's been an amazing um, experience to see students not just sitting with their heads down on a test or a quiz or an essay but actually uh, engaged with one another, grappling with historical uh, and, and current events. So in the left-hand side of this slide, you see two uh, examples of the Model United Nations simulation uh, that we partner with the Model UN Club. And this is a student-run simulation where students uh, across all of our sections, uh, or almost all of our sections of uh, World History II and the AP Modern History, uh, they get together one day at the end of May this year we're going to do it virtually, but uh, in past years there we take over five, six rooms in the across the high school, and students are grappling with current issues, historical simulations, playing roles, advocating for positions, and it's all research based. They've selected the evidence and brought it to the table, and and they're they're working together. Uh, uh, really pleased to work together in that left hand picture uh, with a, with a speech that's going on, and then in the the next one over, it's a a crisis room where they're dealing with war crimes. So. Uh, lots more serious. In the middle, we have another kind of informed action, our senior econ students uh, crossing the street to South School a couple of years ago and working uh, with children in, I think this is first grade, uh, on um, economic principles through using uh, children's literature. In the upper right, you have students uh, engaged in a mock trial, putting legal principles they've learned into practice. And, and also, again, that uh, that interrogation, debate, discussion uh, that, that goes on. And then the bottom right, I thought important to emphasize that informed action isn't, uh, you know, storming the town hall or anything. This is uh, about action within our community that makes sense to help each other. Uh, and, and so here we have AP World Modern students uh, on the first day of school, opening up a box from the previous year's students with a survival kit and advice for them on how to succeed in AP uh, World History. Um, I think these all just demonstrate that that uh, our, our our students are taking informed action in ways I was never asked to in high school anyway, and I I, I suspect many of you weren't either. Uh, thanks. And so we wanted to talk next about some of the professional learning that's helping us improve what we do with students, helping us continue to be uh, to offer great courses. And we wanted to start with K eight. Um, so, Mary. yeah, I'm looking at the time. We want to be asked back again, so we don't want to overstay our welcome. So right. we'll we'll try to hit just the the high points of it. We are passionate about what we do. So, um, just we've been so so grateful. I guess that's the overarching piece that we couldn't do professional learning without all of your support from Dr. Carenti, Dr. Lutzi, all the way to the Board of Ed um, and, and parents and the release extra rele release time that we've had on Wednesdays. Although it's a sacrifice on one one in one sense, it's also been um, wonderful as our grade K five teachers are not content trained to the level that our 612 educators are to be able to work with them with some frames and to deepen their understanding about not just history but how to teach the units um just 
very briefly on the left is a triangle that um, a group that we're working with called Facing History in Ourselves um, uses. And it really helps us put that, that child is in the center. Our students are the informed civic responsibility holders. Um, and thinking about three different dimensions that any issue anything takes is the intellectual rigor, which I think, you know, hands down, we've got in New Canaan, the emotional engagement where it attaches um, to our civic responsibility and ethical reflection. So we've been really thinking about those three, really K-8 and how they influence our thinking, thinking about the head, heart and conscience of a unit of a issue. So even if we think about something like the pandemic, which we're all living and sharing in, it, it, provi it provokes different responses from us at different times, but all of that makes our decision making. Um, so that's been a really helpful lens. We've done some work with some organizers, which we call clearing the fog, which is anytime we look at an issue or even a new culture, what are the facts that we know? What are the opinions and what are the generalizations, which could be stereotypes? Um, when we look at a culture that's not our own, we've worked with elementary teachers on really keeping visual voices and connections on the forefront. And this connects, I think, with our equity work is what are the visuals that we're presenting or not presenting to students, especially our young learners? Whose voices are in this work? Whose voices are missing? Who would you want to hear from, but maybe don't hear from? And then what are those connections? So if I'm talking about a country um, in a, you know, someplace besides the United States, how are we connected? So yeah, there's gonna be differences, but how are we similar? How are we connected in some way, shape or form? And then in the middle is just a way that we've been trying to bring Native American history more into um, our study, especially whenever we talk about colonization or making sure that we have a complete story of um, this continent. And this is a great uh, way where you can actually Google or you can put in a place that you know, and it will generate who lived there in the past, what Native American groups lived there in the past, and also how you can connect any um, descendants of that group um, wherever they may be displaced and living um, now. So this just some quick so, yeah, great. It, it was really overwhelming this to think about the professional learning. There's so much going on on so many levels. I sorted it into three categories here, but uh, internally, we're really grateful for the time on Wednesdays to work in PLCs. And we, we also meet during the school day. But uh, like when I have 10 teachers on a course, we, we can't all meet in the same period. So it's great to have that time. Um, the curriculum writing that, that Dr. Carenti supported and, and the district supported have been, has been amazing. Uh, we have great partnerships within the school through the writing center that'll, I hope, hopefully be back next year. Uh, the, 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 with the library, the ICT department and the model UN club. Externally, teachers have sought out some amazing opportunities. It's been easier this year because lots of these conferences and these certifications and projects are, are, uh, virtual. Uh, but we, we've sent uh, teachers in the past to the Harvard case study method. We haven't adopted it whole cloth. We use what makes sense for our our uh, courses. And and same with Brown and uh, Choices and, uh, at, at Brown, the Princeton Institute. And um, we have two Madison fellows now. So really proud of all the opportunities teachers have taken advantage of outside of the school. Uh, in the community, we have some great partnerships. And this is not a complete list, but some some groups we work with. Uh, where it makes sense and fits in with the curriculum. So thanks to the community for um, helping us out. Uh, and I think we wanted to look forward briefly to what are our next steps. Yeah, and it's similar probably um, across the spectrum. Um, you know, we're going to continue K-8 really just, you know, reviewing, selecting sources that incorporate diversity of voice and authorship, continue that work, um, continue to review for cultural responsiveness. Um, 6-8, we're going to continue our work with Facing History in Ourselves and just like anything, whether it be choices from Brown or whatever, we don't adopt everything you know, as a whole, we adapt and, and modify um, to meet the needs that we have here in New Canaan for our own students. And I think a big part of the work is too, is to continue that work in differentiation, 
to make sure that we're meeting the needs of all students. Um, and we really enjoyed Andrea Hagensfeld. Hopefully I said her name right. Dr. Hagensfeld um, really did a wonderful job of outlining some next steps that we can take to make sure that we're um, doing right by all of our students. At the high school, the one very specific piece we're working on is the state has passed a mandate for all uh, high schools in Connecticut to offer a Black and Latino Studies course. Um, so we're watching that, and and it's it's one of those where the state's going to give us some curricular materials and resources, and we're going to do our best to figure out what what how that makes sense to be a great course at at New Canaan. Um, and, and we're working on that through the department and through the curriculum committee at the high school. And uh, we'll bring that work to the curriculum council as well. Uh, we'll continue to review and revise uh, unit UBDs and, and as well continue to nurture the in, interdepartmental and community relationships we have. So there's plenty of work left. <laughs> <laughs> We'd love to answer any questions that you might have. Thanks for listening so far. Yeah. Thank you both for um, this very comprehensive and excellent presentation. It's um, really nice to see, uh, take the time to spend some time on some curriculum and, and uh, see what the kids have been up to the last couple of years. Uh, Sherry? Um, yeah, great. Just I, also echoing what Katrina said, great, very thorough presentation, but it's really nice to take the deep dive into social studies. And I love, Mary, how you talked about the focus on educating the next generation of citizens and Bob, how you talked about engaging and grapple, having the students engage and grapple with both current and historical events. I mean, I just, I really appreciated everything in the presentation. Um, I'm just hoping that you could maybe just say a little bit more um, on the K through 12 about how you're reviewing um, the diversity of what we teach and just if you can kind of talk, I mean, that's a big job. So I just kind of want to get a sense of, you know, how that's being structured and how that's being executed. And then Bob, specifically on the Public Act 1912, um, I know you said you're kind of waiting, um, but I know, you know, schools can implement that as soon as the fall of 21. It sounds like we're waiting to the fall of 22, but any other specifics you can provide on um, the Black and Latino studies, I'd appreciate it. Do you want to go ahead, Mary, or start or? Sure. Um, gosh, it's mm -hmm. there's I don't want to spend all, all night here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that in the K-5 level, um, our units were written so that diverse voices could come in. We didn't always have the resources. So um, and teachers didn't always have the training. I think that um, there's been so many publishers that have done wonderful, wonderful work that we've been able, as we think about civics at an elementary level, parts of that are contributions, right? People who have been citizens before us and who have contributed and expanding that to the bigger story that we've had um, a lot of good resources that have been vetted. One place that we do look when you're thinking about structures is um, our social studies um, organization has a notable books section um, where they do rate books and re, um, they've got peer reviews that think about some of the concepts and, and books along with some of the um, several different awards, right, that go out for books. So we've been looking systematically with picture books that can integrate across. And obviously social studies doesn't own this uh, by itself. It's so integrated in elementary school, but we're definitely looking at getting diverse voices. And at middle school, facing history in ourselves has really helped us look at humanizing the curriculum. And so we're looking at certain kinds of questions that we are going to interrogate our curriculum with to make sure that we do have those different voices. And that most importantly, we empower our students to be asking for some of those voices as well. Um, so it's not just coming from us. If there's a voice missing, we would love our students to say at some point, well, wait a minute, this kind of, you know, this group of people's not represented here, or I wonder what the people with this occupation would say um, to make sure that we're always inquiring and always um, thinking about all the different people. So I could go on and on, but I hope that sort of starts to answer the question at the K-8 level. Yeah, and in the high school, I would want to emphasize, although I mentioned that there wasn't as much performance-based um, role playing and, and simulations going on when I got to the high school. The thing that was going on at the high school is 
back since 2001, we've offered two years of world history, not not European, not Western Civ. It's been world history since 2001. And the driving force behind that was really the college board's introduction of uh, the world, world, uh, the world AP course at that point. Um, we're proud that it's, it's, it's a, a course that dates back 20 years at this point, uh, or two courses that date back 20 years. It, it's our third cycle of, of global curriculum writing in the, in the 15 years I've been there. Um, it, it, our most passionate and uh, lengthy discussion during this summer's uh, curriculum writing in, in, on the, the world history course was about uh, voice in history. Um, whose voices are students reading? Whose voices are they hearing? Not just in the documents they're reading, but the historians they're hearing from. Uh, can we do a better job diversifying who's telling the story of, of history? And we're asking the question, we're not going into it with a, an answer. Um, and, and then our, our case studies. We've always had a fairly diverse range of case studies that we approach with students. Our, our unit topics are, are intentionally broad because we have students looking at um, a, a really wide range of, of cases. Say when we look at collapse, we're looking at Easter Island, we're looking at Rome, we're looking at uh, why did Japan succeed where others failed? Why did, and, and so I'm really proud of both the two year sequence and, and the rethinking we, we keep coming back to, are we hearing uh, the right voices and doing the right things there? Um, specifically on the Black and Latino Studies course, uh, at this point, we, we've been doing a lot of gathering resources. Um, Mary and I have both been attending uh, state meetings with Steve Armstrong, the state uh, social studies curriculum director. I was hesitant, we were hesitant as a department to offer, try to offer the course in the pilot year this coming year. Uh, w one reason was the state is for the first time giving us significant curricular materials. We don't have them yet. The state hasn't released them. Uh, they've released drafts of unit titles and in some cases, some details about a unit on each course. Uh, it's not enough. It's not enough for me to have confidence going into the fall with, without any of the materials that they'll expect us to use. So uh, we are going to spend the year writing, uh, gathering our resources, looking at how it's working out. It, it looks to me like a, a few schools in the, it doesn't look to me, I've, I've, we've investigated this, a few schools in the region are, are, are offering the course as a pilot next year and many are not. Um, we want to make, we want to do this right and, and if I have a, 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 a a bias about what the course should be. I hope we can make it an interdisciplinary course where we bring in not just different voices uh, within the social studies uh, milieu, but uh, literature and art and music and, and the other pieces. And I also view this as a lens for, through which we, we can re-examine our, our, our teaching of US history and world history. Great, that's very helpful. And it sounds like an excellent vision, thank you. Thanks. Other questions or comments? Penny? Yeah, I just wanted to thank you for all of your hard work. And, and um, you know, people a lot of times ask me, what is it that makes New Canaan schools uh, so terrific? And I think a, a large part of it is that we have baked into our program the work that you two are doing with your curriculum teams and you're reassessing our units in a very uh, systematic, sensitive way. And every year we're upgrading, we're improving. And so um, I've asked other people, do you have these type of curriculum leaders across K-8, 9, 12? And a lot of times school districts don't. So um, one of the things I, I sometimes thought was missing was the coordination K through 12. And obviously, you know, that is something in history that you're doing extremely well and you've been doing for a while, because I remember back from your uh, prior presentation, um, back in 2015, you were working on, on it already. So uh, just thank you for all the great work. Um, please keep coming back to the Board of Ed, um, you know, uh, to make certain that we're giving you the resources to continue um, to do your work. And uh, thank all your staffs, because I think uh, the successes of our districts uh, are resting on on this very basic kind of unit by unit uh, examination and improvement. Thanks. Great. Julie. 
Yes, thank you so much for the presentation. And I think one thing that impresses me about it is is the the goal of creating um, people, responsible citizens who are engaged in the world and who are able to apply what they're learning. It's not just regurgitation the way at least I learned history, um, you know, of, of throwing back facts. Like these kids are learning how to apply it and how to, to work within the world. And I think, um, you know, I've seen it with with my two who are in college that that they, the skills that they are learning, that they did learn in New Canaan, um, from a young age, you know, I mean, I just, it, it's so impressive to see what these kids and even in elementary school are doing. Um, and they get to college and they, they know the stuff that so many of their peers have never, um, have never learned how to apply um, their, their research and their work. So thank you so much for um, really, you know, helping our kids, not just in history, but, but uh, in terms of being responsible citizens and, um, learning how to how to synthesize what they what they hear, what they read, how to not take everything at face value, but to question and um, you know from a very young age. So thank you. Great, thanks, Julie. I, I just have one question, and it's a comment and a question. I, I recall a few years ago there was a presentation um, where we you you shared sort of the connections between the language arts, the social studies and the different depart the departmental initiatives. And I know that something we hear consistently year after year from the kids that graduate and come back and, and share some of their on-campus experiences with us is that um, the strength of their writing and how prepared they feel for some of these college level courses. And um, I know you talked about, you know, the importance of social studies in reading acquisition and the connections with the EI work that we have, but um, could you also comment on the, on the writing? Because I know, you know, we have the strength of our language arts department, but then there's just so much of the critical thinking and the DBQ and all of the development of the writing skills over the years. Um, and I'm just curious, you know, if there's, if that's an area of, of continued focus or um, what, what else we can offer there. Yeah, I can jump in. I, I, you know, I would say that probably when we think about prioritizing standards, a lot of our standards are clustered around argumentation. Um, so that goes into speaking, listening, and reading and writing argument. Um, so those are definitely shared standards, especially at the middle school. Um, we work very much hand in glove with ELA on those standards. They look a little different in the social studies realm, but if you can do them in the social studies realm, you can do them in language arts. So we do take uh, great ownership and pride in helping our, our kids really develop those those kind of skills all the way through. And it is through DBQs, it is through academic conversations where they get that rehearsal to do that um, in more sustained ways. And, and if you wanted, we could come back next week with a, a whole, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. We could. Uh, we could easily. So the, the point I would make is at the heart of all the performance that you saw students doing, you know, standing, pointing, deliberation, uh, at the heart of that is writing. They're, they're coming to these events and these uh, simulations with briefs written, with lines of questioning developed, with uh, thesis driven essays, even it's all there at the, at the heart of it. It's just, um, uh, this inquiry art made it uh, easier to show visually what they're doing. Uh, but the writing is is the backbone of all of this. They're they're uh, getting better at reading comp and taking notes and organizing those notes and and using them to make their arguments and um, uh, and and collaborate do their collaborative writing and their refining and revision. It, all the pieces that are in LA are also in social studies. What we do with students in social studies. That's great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, anything else? Again, thank you so much for spending time with us and sharing all of the wealth of um, information and the great work that you, you've been doing. So. Thanks for your support. Thank you so much. Appreciate the time. Okay. All right. Thank you, Bob and thank Mary. You. Your passion for social studies definitely shown through. <laughs> so, but <laughs> I think, I think Dr. Lutzi is going to move you to the other side. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just going to say, don't take it personally. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> uh, we're going to uh, demote or promote. I'm not sure which one you to attendee. And thank you. Wonderful job. There we go.
Okay. Okay. So moving on to our final item, uh, budget update. Do you want to start, Dr. Lutze, or do you want me to? Up to you. Okay. Um, well, I'll start and then you can add any comments. I think uh, as far as budget, we, um, since we last met, we uh, had our town council meeting our final budget presentation and they voted on uh, a budget and approved the budget uh, unanimously. So we certainly appreciate that. Um, and, uh, but I'll, I'll just say that the budget process this year has been challenging and continues to be challenging. Um, as you are all aware, uh, we started the process with the Board of Finance initially cutting the budget by um, a little over $3 million during the regular budget process. And um, we had reassurance of a special appropriation um, leading up to that vote. Uh, we shared some concerns around how the internal services fund uh, would be funded and also um, with some issues related to the insurance and those concerns were shared. And we've, we've talked about that a lot leading up to this. Um, and on the day before the town council's vote on our reduced budget, the uh, resources committee, um, we met with Todd Lavieri and members of the board of finance the day prior to the town council budget vote to review the details of our special appropriation. And in that meeting, we were assured that uh, we would be appropriated uh, the $1.97 million um, for insurance expenses. And, and those were to be included in the BOE's operating budget in addition to anticipated COVID expense expenditures of $185,000. So we sent an email summarizing our discussion that you all received. And um, I, I believe, and we all thought we were on the same page uh, with respect to that. So today upon reviewing the Board of Finance agenda, we. Um, we see that it doesn't appear that this is the case. The special appropriation lang language that's outlined in the agenda reads as follows. Um, the request for approval of a special appropriation in FY2122 in the amount of $1.97 million into the general fund contingency account for potential additional transfers in the Board of Education Health Internal Service Fund if needed. Source of the funds will be unspent funds and or use of fund balance. So this takes us back to the issue of legality of a contingent appropriation. Uh, we've discussed that the BOA, BOE cannot deficit spend and we cannot operate outside of our policy and our statutory responsibility with respect to budgeting. So creating a contingency fund for our self-insured plan does not equate to a fully funded budget. Um, it's still a budget cut as the funding is contingent and it's not guaranteed. So as the Board of Finance wishes to base this decision on actual experience uh, rather than our submitted actuarial estimates, um, this is an issue uh, with Connecticut legality uh, for a town's fiscal body to take such action. So I just, you know, I'm trying to make it clear that this is not the path we thought we were on after our last meeting with the Board of Finance. And unfortunately, this will likely lead us to have to make some difficult decisions and budget cuts. Um, it leaves the Board of Ed in a difficult situation and um, it's not where we want it to be. So I would simply add to that and then open up to discussion that the um, one of our challenges here, and there are several, but one certainly is the, the sort of elongation of the budget process. So in, a, in the past, uh, the other years, certainly at the, after the vote of the town council, the budget were approved or however it is, then we're able to begin planning forward and we're, be able, we're able to begin looking at if there are initiatives in there and other things, uh, we're able to start doing that planning. At this point, unfortunately, since we've got a whole nother process now to go through uh, and we're not sure that that's going to get us where we thought it would after the meeting with resources and board of finance members prior to the town council vote, um, it's really premature to have discussions about uh, next year's budget because it's, um, so up in the air. And I'm, I'm saying this specifically because I know there certainly are folks um, that, and I know members of the board want to have conversation about school start times, other initiatives that are in there. But unfortunately, until we have our appropriation as a board of education, as a district, uh, we're unable to make firm commitments around any of that. Um, because, uh, you know, tell us just quickly for anyone who's interested, a board of education's budget is different than a, a town budget than other municipal budgets. The Board of Education is 
It's a dual entity. It's a state entity and a municipal entity. And by statute, Board of Education is, it does uh, determine the allocations of the funding within its budget. Uh, the other town budgets have to go before Board of Finance, Town Council with specific line items. And then to move money between those line items, they have to, they have a process they have to go through. A Board of Ed, ultimately a Board of Ed budget is a single appropriation. And we create our budget as an itemized estimate. We stay true to that. We report to you, as you know, second meeting of the month with our statement of accounts and all, all of our budget management tools that we have. We bring that to resources to talk about how the expenditures are going. Any transfer between object is approved, you know, brought before the Board of Education for approval. So there are lots of controls and, and um, processes built into budget management. But it's all within the Board of Education, because from the town to the Board of Ed, it's a single number and a single appropriation. And this, this change this year is changing the dynamics of that process that is governed by statute by saying that this, this money will be appropriated and held in this contingency account that should you need it, you know, we'll move it over. Um, and that's just, that's not how the budget process and budget management for a Board of Education works as defined by statute and has, as has always been, you know, our practice and is the practice of 168 other school districts in Connecticut. There are 169 total. You know, this is, that's just how it, how it works. And it's intentional that the Board of Ed has that kind of flexibility so that you can be responsive to issues as they arise in service to students student learning, student safety, and the work, the, the enormous responsibility that Board of Ed members and administrators and all of us have in schools. If we had to go before a town bodies and go through the appropriation process, uh, as the other you know, town, um, the municipal side does, it could significantly impact the school day, school safety, other things. So they, the state understands that. And that's why the Board of Ed has that authority. That's why we can move within objects and then bring it to you after, or if we move across, you vote uh, formally to approve. So it is different. It's, in, it's intended to be different for a Board of Ed because of the significance of the work that we do in service to children. And in order to be able to respond swiftly to changing needs and dynamics that occur. So this, this shift is, um, I would say maligned to that belief um, that you know the, that flexibility is really would no longer be there. Uh, and whether we're talking about this contingency for insurance that our actuary has told us we need in order to fund our insurance, or if we were talking about needing potentially needing kindergarten teachers next year, you know they couldn't create by statute they couldn't create a contingency account somewhere else to say if you if you need it kindergarten teacher, just come get, tell us and we'll move you over the money. It just doesn't work that way for boards of ed and it intentionally doesn't by state statute. So that's, um, I wanted to just go, just explain that difference because it may seem nuanced, but it's not. It's very, there's very specific concrete difference between budget management for a board of ed versus a municipality. Okay, sorry. Yeah. I Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Brendan. Sorry. Sorry. Um, yeah, I just want to say, I mean, not only statutorily does this not work, um, but it's 100% inconsistent with what we have been told by uh, the Board of Finance. And I think, I believe I heard the same out of town council, um, which is that we'll, we will be fully funded. There are no cuts. Um, what this does, and I'm looking at this language, it literally just, it's like a shell game moving money from one town account to another town account and then saying they'll potentially fund the board of education if if needed um which is just 100 percent inconsistent with what we were told which is that we would be fully funded um fully funded means that we start the school year knowing that we have enough money to um to meet all the needs of the district um that's not what this is this is hey, Board of Education, come back to us, Town Council and Board of Finance, and we'll you know, drip, drip feed the New Canaan Public Schools at some point during the school year if needed. Um, we can't manage the schools, as we've said, you know, ad nauseum in that way. Um, and again, I'll just you know, I'll say it, it's 100% inconsistent with what we've been told you know, to our faces in multiple meetings. So it needs to change. 
Thanks, Brennan. Diana. Sorry, I had to change computers mid mid meeting, and I'm like, "Where's the mute unmute?" Um, so I, I just wanted to, you know, echo sort of what's already been said, but I think it's important. I, in all my years on the board, I have never ever been in a meeting where I have been told specifically, and it has been reiterated that something's going to be handled one way, and then, you know, consistently coming back with something different. It, it's it's um, it really doesn't foster an atmosphere of trust or um, collegiality. And um, it's a disservice to our, not only our kids, it's a disservice to the parents, a disservice to the teachers, it's a disservice to this community. Um, we've worked really hard over the last, you know, as many years as I've been on the board, which is coming on eight years now, um, to sort of uh, add to the level of detail that's provided to the various boards to get them more comfortable with how everything's managed. We're an elected board that is elected specifically to manage uh, what happens within the Board of Education. And it this really truly feels like um, an unelected board is trying to take control over the management of um, the operations of the Board of Education and um, is you know, as, as Dr. Lutze alluded to, that's not their role. And, um, you know, the, the state specifically gives the Board of Education the ability to manage finances once the budget is, is given to them. And I think this action is the Board of Finance trying to do an end run around our, our authority. Quite frankly, that's exactly what they're doing. And it's, really troubling um, as a board member. And so I think, um, and I'm, I'm also really troubled because the day, the day after the town council meeting where the chair said the board of ed budget has been fully funded and the headline in the New Canaan advertiser is board of ed budget is fully funded and all programs will be completely taken care of. You know, it's, it's, it's lying to the public. And, and I think, you know, I don't know why they're not hearing the other side of the story, but I think it's important for our community to understand what's happening here. This is really troubling as a board member. Uh, Julie. And also it just, it's the, the Board of Finance is um, sort of redefining what a budget is. <laughs> you know, but a budget just inherently is, you're making your best prediction on what your um, expenses will be based on uh, prior experience, based on on knowledge, and what they're saying to us is um, we are not going to trust that, and we are only going to fund it once we see actuals. Which again, the, the purpose of a budget is you you are making your best um, estimate as to what costs will be. So um, they're they're essentially telling us no, that's not how a budget works, and then that's very um, that is very troubling. Yep. Thank you. Penny. So this would be the first budget year that I've ever gone into where we're, our budget has not been fully funded. I mean, this is like another contingent uh, appropriation. And I, I think that it's really important for the public to understand that it's putting the Board of Ed in a very bad situation. And, and, you know, that could potentially affect the education of this district. And the 1.9 million needs to be awarded to the Board of Education. We have a fully transparent budget. We will show the town how it's expended. If the insurance claims uh, do not come up to those predicted by our actuary, we will, uh, that money gets returned back to the town. It gets folded over into the next year's budget. There's nothing, this, we, we zero, um, you know, uh, balance that to zero every single year. So there's nothing that continues over from year to year. And, you know, it's disappointing to see the language. I think we should reach out to the Board of Finance and see if they will correct it to what I understood uh, was agreed upon in our meeting about a week and a half ago, which was that the 1.9 million, which is needed to fund our 40% of the uh, uh, corridor and the anticipated claims for the year, would go directly into our budget, not be contingent 
Uh, it, I also think that this just violates the statutory scheme as it's been interpreted by the Connecticut uh, Supreme Court in that, um, I think it's the, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the Ellington, uh, town of Ellington case. You're not allowed to create buckets and for the Board of Ed. You give the Board of Ed one appropriation. And um, by creating the bucket, they've agreed that it's reasonable. Uh, that's It's specifically on point with that case and it's in contravention of that case. Sherry? So I just want to second what Penny just said um, that I would like to, you know, ask Katrina as the as the chair that you go back to the Board of Finance and, and ask them to correct the wording. I do want to thank Katrina, the entire resources committee and our administration for their leadership on this. But at the same time, Katrina, I think we should also communicate that you know, the very laborious nature of this budget process, the amount of back and forth is very distracting for our administration at a time when it's, you know, a Herculean effort to like maintain academic excellence, you know, as we continue through this pandemic. And I just think it needs to be expressed um, that what's being, the burden that's being put on the, our administration right now through this budget process is untenable. Thank you. Deanna. And I know we've said this before, but what the, the language in this um, motion for tomorrow night is in direct violation of a signed agreement with the Board of Education. It's in, in direct violation of something that was negotiated. So I, I, I've never been involved in anything where people, you know, there's no discussion and they violate policy. Great. And I, I think that, you know, there has been back and forth. This has been communicated clearly numerous times um, that this is in direct violation of the policy and um, that this is not, you know, the budget process as we as we've known it for many, many years. Go ahead, Brendan. Yeah. And just to be clear, I think you you kind of said it, Katrina and, and Brian, you alluded to it as well. But to be clear, if this language stays the way it is, we're going to have a one point nine seven million dollar hole in our budget that we're going to have to make up for, right? We're going to have to come up with reductions of $1.97 million. Otherwise, we're overspending our budget as we enter the next school year. Um, so it's a, it's, this is a major problem um, that, you know, they claim that they fixed in our, in our meetings, but aren't actually following up to, to, to actually fix it. Um, so it needs to be, the language absolutely needs to be changed. Otherwise, we're going to have, um, you know, our work cut out for us over the, the next couple of months. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Penny. Go ahead. Yep. I mean, I guess I see two basic issues with the way this is set up, and one is that I believe we would have to go through an appropriation process where we would not just have the money transferred, so that it's not a certainty that it would come to the board of ed. That'd be one question, and maybe that would need to be clarified with the board of finance. Then the second question is, even if that money can be transferred without going through an appropriation process, it violates the statutory scheme because it's saying you can have the money only if you spend it. And that's not the way Connecticut was set up. That's not how it's been interpreted by the Connecticut Supreme Court. So I, I see two major problems with it. And, and, and it's possible that the first one could be solved. I don't know if we've had clarity on how that money is to be accessed, but it doesn't solve the second problem uh, where it is not in accordance with the way that school budgets are supposed to be funded uh, under the statute as interpreted by the Connecticut Supreme Court. Yep. Yep. Thank you, Penny. Uh, so as a next step, we will uh, send a notification or a communication to the Board of Finance tomorrow. So. And, and look, I, I think I, it sounded to me that there were a lot of good intentions in that meeting and, you know, potentially we could we could fix this. We are agreeing on the number now, the, the 1.9, uh, but we we need to agree that that money needs to be in the Board of Ed budget, not in a contingent fund. And there's a world of difference between the two. Agreed. Okay. Uh, anything else, Dr. Lutzi, on the budget? Or anyone else? Okay. I was going to bring up start times. Oh, okay. Just that I would, I would like to just, let's assume we get through this budget impasse, because I'm assuming 
you know, everybody will eventually, uh, will eventually sort this out. Um, do we, do we have any feeling on like a schedule at least? I, think, I know there's a lot of anxiety out there on, you know, what the start time implementation is going to look like mid year and how we make that happen. So it might be that we're going to do an update in, in an upcoming meeting or, you know, how we're going to, how we're going to solve that. But um, I think, th I think there's a lot of anxiety out there, especially at the elementary level. Um, uh, what I'm hearing. So, uh, you know, the, the resources are such an important part of it, but I do think once that gets settled out, um, a good next step would be to put a working group together that can have some conversations sort of backwards map, you know, some things, including process. The, I had, but I did talk to Roy today. Uh, there is a significant lead time on buses. Um, you may or may not have heard about the shortage in microchips and how the auto manufacturers are expecting that to impact the industry, amongst others, and that may also slow down the bus production. Um, so it's probably an eight month lead time minimum, you know, with buses. Um, so you know, this month here is kind of, is a bit of a, an issue for you know, making any kind of a commitment, but, you know, we'll work with it. Uh, the, so, so I think that's probably, you know, whether it's the, the second meeting in May, maybe we can um, get a little deeper into that and sort of, and put kind of talk through that process and kick that off. Um, the, there are other things happening. Like I've been, I've, I've talked about the nature center multiple times, as you know, and those things I met with a group the week before break to talk to them about, uh, after school programming for elementary. And they've worked with some um, districts, Palo Alto, Winneka, some others where, you know, I know the superintendents in different spots and they've come very highly recommended. Uh, and it's kind of a turnkey solution uh, where they could five days a week, they could come in, they do the training, they could they even sometimes um, either profit share or develop scholarships for kids based on money with districts, things like that. So those sorts of conversations are happening. So that when the time is right and we're ready, we can bring them all to the table uh, for whoever's around the table and sort of put that process in place to accelerate uh, and make those connections. So the um, so as far as timing goes, I think that's probably a fair kind of place to put it, say, you know, mid-May, we've got to have a conversation about this regardless because of that, you know, that eight, eight month lead time. So I don't want to say any later than that. And if we can have the conversation sooner because things are resolved quick, more quickly, I'll be the happiest guy in the room. Great. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so no action items this evening. We'll move on to any comments from the public. Let's see. Sorry, I think Mr. Yao was the first, so let me hit allow to talk here. Oh, James, you should be on. Okay, great. I just, this is short. I just had a quick question. Uh, when or did you have a plan to disseminate this information or, or the plan to elementary school parents via uh, through their, the local school newsletter or, or through a, a wider broadcast so, so some of these parents can start kind of preparing or doing what needs to be done. Uh, it's a fairly big change for many. I, I think just letting them know would really help. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, oh. Sorry. Uh, Thank you, James. Jennifer, I think you're all set. Uh, yep. Uh, thank you. Um, I know you all have received a, an extraordinary amount of uh, notices and letters um, from folks, but I spent um, four hours yesterday speaking with uh, daycare parents who had children in nursery schools, some in elementary, and the level of distress in their feel in, in their attitudes was heartbreaking. Not only that, 
they they also feel really blindsided. They feel it has been hidden. They have approached their heads of um, the the daycares and the and the nursery centers. They've approached um, principals of elementary schools and been told can't talk about it. And it's just not okay. And um, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, we mostly all moved to McKinnon for the schools and are highly supportive and, um, and, and, you know, are amazed. However, this particular issue for so many has taken such a turn. And, um, but the overwhelming feeling was there is a way to do better. There is a way to be more inclusive. There is a way to fix this and come with a solution that is not the potential four minutes, which we know we probably aren't going to find trying to squeeze blood from a stone. And they're expecting it and they want it. And more importantly, they want transparency and they need to hear quickly, not in May. I mean, May is pretty much here, not in June. They need it now. They're angry. Um, And, and, and um, I, some of them are just finding out. I know for me, it's been a year and a half. I saw my friend who brought me to the first meeting and I said, I blame you. I was totally oblivious to all this and I blame you (laughs) and I'm here now. They're just finding out they're balancing kids and they're, you're asking them to have children at home who are asleep and in pre-K, but they've got to wake them up to get a kid to the bus for seven o'clock or seven 15 and then go back. Like it is completely disruptive. It is not just elementary and middle. It is, I've got babies at home and then someone's got to go to the bus, but someone's sleeping, et cetera. It, it's this bouncing. It's not a good plan. We can do better. And honestly, that's all they're asking for. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh... Moving on to announcements and future business. Dr. Lutze. Sure. Um, Briefly, our next meeting with the Board of Education will be on May 3rd. Uh, You may have heard that uh, the governor's authority for the executive actions, executive orders was extended through May 20th. So we will uh, remain virtual, I think, on the 3rd. Uh, at that point, we'll be talking about the graduation date. We do want to go ahead and get that set. Um, the reason why we don't have it today is we were waiting for those guidelines to come out. And now we're going to look at those at the days to see, um, you know, we don't have the, we won't have the flexibility to move inside if need be with high school graduation. So we may look to even sort of build in a, a third day if need be uh, for the timing on that, which, so we'll have that on the third, on May 3rd. Uh, and of course, we'll have another budget update and, uh, Hopefully we get to a good place. Great. Thank you. Uh, With that, is there a motion to adjourn? Deanna, second, Penny, all in favor? All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone.